Again, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the SRAB webinar related to our dual enrollment initiative and its focus on helping students gain skills needed to be successful in high demand, high skilled careers. My name is Dale Winkler and I am the SRAB Senior Vice President. The SRAB dual enrollment initiative helps state policymakers, including legislators, realize the full potential of dual enrollment. All 16 SREB states offer dual enrollment programs, which allow high school students to take college courses and receive credit for both. Due to the interest in these programs, all of the states in our compact have passed some form of dual enrollment legislation in the past five years. The initiative evaluates the ideas, problems, and goals involved to understand the impact that dual enrollment can have on students, employers, communities, schools, and colleges. In 2019, SRAB launched the Dual Enrollment Initiative to help Southern states realize the promise and potential of dual enrollment. The Dual Enrollment Advisory Panel was convened to guide this endeavor, bringing together expertise from across the region. The panel defined dual enrollment as college courses taught to high school students for both college and high school credit. The panel consists of K-12 educators, post-secondary administrators, state education agencies at both the secondary and post-secondary levels, as well as legislators. The panel, in, in one of its early meetings, identified some common challenges facing SREB states for both students, some of those for students are access, eligibility, and cost, and also challenges for programs, and those are quality, transfer, funding, data, and reporting. The group framed the initiative's uh, examination of dual enrollment within three aligned perspectives that you see here on the stage, or on the slide, I should say. One, as a, an early start to completing post-secondary credentials. Two, a key component for workforce development. And three, a means for students to master industry-valued success skills. The three perspectives are unique and differ from many other dual enrollment discussions taking place across our nation. The panel began with a comprehensive study of the literature and it reviewed um, a lot of different literature uh, on dual enrollment studies going back to 30 and 40 years ago, as well as review, reviewed uh, related legislation across uh, the 16 states in our region. Several conversations have focused on teacher preparation for dual enrollment, and this past year, SRB staff have addressed the third perspective related to industry value success skills. To meet the demands of jobs now and in the future, job seekers should possess a variety of skills frequently requested by employers, and skills can be both academic and technical in nature, but also include personal qualities or advanced cognitive skills. Today, you'll hear about a recent review of the literature published uh, report that provides an overview of the non-technical skills most frequently requested by employers. We refer to them as success skills. The lead investigator and author of the recent report is Courtney Leidner, an SREB analyst, and she will be uh, sharing an overview of her work and the report. Following Courtney's presentation, Dr. Tim Shaughnessy, SREB Director of Career Pathways and Coordinator of the Dual Enrollment Initiative, will hold a discussion with Dr. Rose Proctor, and uh, she'll be talking about Georgia Best Program. It's a promising practice that we're excited to highlight during today's uh, webinar. So now I'm going to turn it over to Courtney, and she will provide an overview of what she learned in studying about success skills. As she is a talking. If you have questions, if you'll put those either in the chat or the q and I'll keep an eye on those. And if we have time, we'll pause at some point and answer those questions. Um, but just encourage you to uh, put those in the chat or in the Q&A section, and I will monitor them. So Courtney, I turn it over to you. All right. Thank you, Dale. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Courtney Leidner. I am an analyst um, with the SREB School Improvement Division, and I'm going to provide you all with a little bit of the background for our discussion of success skills today. So um, we published a report in November that major goal was to review recent literature to understand what the most demanded success skills are. 
And in recent decades, there has been a lot of literature on what attributes and talents comprise success skills, but we wanted to revisit that literature with a focus on the perspective of business and industry and really getting an idea from that lens of what skills are truly in demand. So today I'm going to provide you with a brief overview of the report, including defining success skills, the demand for success skills according to our research, and what factors influence labor market demand for these skills. Okay, so just so that we're um, all on the same page and comfortable with the vocabulary that I'm going to be using today, I'd like to first kind of define what how we uh, think of success skills at SREB. Um, and so the skills needed for the workforce are a combination of basic cognitive skills, personality traits, and behaviors. Basic cognitive skills and technical skills are often referred to as hard skills. The basic cognitive skills include competencies such as math and literacy, while technical skills are often job or industry specific and may include abilities such as programming languages, heavy machinery expertise, or automotive repair, just depending on the career, they, they vary. Um, these sets of skills are, are referred to as hard skills, um, mostly because they are academic or technical in nature, gained through education and training or experience, and they are fairly easy to measure or to determine um, somebody's skill set, um, skill level in. On the other side of the skill coin, we have success skills. These are also referred to as soft skills, employability skills, or durable skills. Um, we have opted for the term success skills to highlight their importance in the workforce while differentiating them from the cognitive and technical skill sets. Success skills are personality traits and behaviors, um, and they include competencies such as creativity or collaboration or work ethic. These skills may be present in individuals due to personality styles or socialization, but they are also generally thought to be able to be developed and improved through practice and experience. So fundamentally, success skills enable employees to be more productive and efficient in the workplace. They are also associated with quicker progress in career ladders and logically higher pay as well. Um, they are transferable and generally applicable to broader ranges of occupations than more specialized technical skills. Um, however, the decades of research uh, has shown that employers have identified that um, there's a great number of job seekers that are underskilled in these areas and despite um, awareness of that underskilling, there is a problem that is persisting. And what is perhaps worse is that students and job seekers often overestimate their proficiency in these skills. And so therefore there's a mismatch in employer and employee um, perceptions. And finally, automation and AI, the words of the day, we cannot escape them. Um, they are disrupting the workforce even in the area of success skills. Uh, there are several reasons for this disruption. Um, first, with the launching of generative AI, more jobs are going to be impacted by automation. So where automation might have traditionally happened on an assembly line or in checkout lines in supermarkets, AI will likely enable aspects of very high skill jobs to be automated as well. Think of um, computer pro programming, for instance. Therefore, competencies such as analytical skills, uh, problem solving, and creativity become vastly more important because they cannot be replicated by computers. Additionally, human skills like communication or empathy, um, collaboration become more important as well because those are uniquely human skills. So, the term success skills covers a broad range of attributes. This inventory um, that I'm providing here on the slide covers some of the most prominent ones found in the studies that we reviewed. Um, in my research with job postings data, um, the number of soft skills listed in job postings in the SREB region over the past year totaled 
um, 111. So there's quite a few different skills that are, are getting lumped um, into the success skills or soft skills domains. And so what we wanted to do was really um, dig deeper and find the ones that uh, rise to the top and um, understand the strength of demand for certain types of skills in a way that is actually conducive to guiding policy and creating roadmaps for best practices in skill development. And so I'd like to take a minute and, and invite you all, um, if you would, to kind of enter in the chat skill in the chat um, skills that you think that might should be included in this inventory that you don't see, or any particular skills that resonate with you due to their um, importance in your field, and um, just to get a, a gauge of, get a gauge of how these skills resonate um, with you all. So I'll, I'll be quiet for just a moment and let you all enter in the chat your thoughts on on what are the common success skills or important success skills. Thank you. I've seen some responses flowing in. So thank you. I see dedication, communication, um, acceptance, um, also communication between technical and non-technical groups. So I see, you know, that there's a lot of um, resonance with some of the lists and some some that are a little bit different from what we see here. All right, I'm going to move on. Thank you all for your thoughts. So again, the question that really drove our research here was trying to identify what skills are most in demand. And to answer this question, we wanted to be thorough yet focused. And so we reviewed reports spanning a 10 year period from 2013 to 2023, um, really focusing on rigorous and reputable research and specifically investigating how seminal works in this area um, identified demand or how promising research has extended our understanding in this area. And so to provide a little background, research on employer demand typically uses two methodologies. Um, the traditional historical method is a survey of executives or, or, or business leaders or perhaps human resource professionals. Um, however, recently with some of the capabilities in doing analysis with really large data sets and web scraping, um, these have enabled researcher, researchers to use job postings um, as evidence of demand. And so we wanted to be sure and include both approaches to be sure that we were getting a balanced um, perspective. There. Um, so our studies offer a clear top three. Um, again, this table uh, shows the frequency of inclusion in the top five skills across the literature that we reviewed um, for this report. And so communication skills, both written and verbal, teamwork and collaboration, and problem solving or critical thinking really rise to the top very, very clearly here. Um, we did find that skills demanded may vary by methodology, and this may be to the nature of, um, due to the nature of survey research, which often prompts respondents to answer um, more aspirationally or, or to ideal scenarios, abstract scenarios. They're not as based in real world job needs um, as well kind of depending on the respondent, their, their answers may not be as reflective of entry level jobs in their organizations, which we do in job posting see a lot of entry level jobs. We also found variation in skills demanded that's attributable to industry or education levels. Um, this is kind of an understudied area, but that is beginning to bubble up in the demand research as well. 
this chart um, shows the demand in SREB states. So we wanted to extend the research and compare what we see in the, um, the research that we reviewed, the literature that we reviewed that is often reflective of national or international trends. And we wanted to see what was happening in our 16 state SREB region in real time. Um, we found again that the, the trends that we see uh, in the research nationally and internationally are replicated in the top three demanded skills in our region. And this, this particular, um, this particular, these particular results come from a comparison of all industries uh, with a required education above high school. And it's just kind of providing, again, a snapshot of, of one day um, in that area. We also wanted to break this down by industry. So as I mentioned, we saw in the literature um, that has been published that there is some variation by industry. And so looking again, particularly at the SREB states, I compared um, all industries with what we see in health science and STEM. I chose those career fields, particularly because um, they have high demand in our region and a lot of project projected growth over the next five to 10 years. And so I bolded all of the skills that repeat across these comparison groups. Um, all of the groups demand communication and teamwork but problem solving is not as highly in demand in health science careers as in STEM. Health science instead seems to favor relationship oriented and leadership skills, um, while STEM is favoring more critical thinking or project management oriented skills. So I also want to do show or share with you all some extensions of the research that we have done that were not included in the report. Um, this table shows uh, top skills demanded in the SREB region in 2020 compared with 2023. And so one of the things that we're interested in is how are these changing over time and what, what might we be able to expect um, in the future? Now these lists again are showing um, skills demanded in all regions in the SREB region and also requiring above a high school diploma. So just to start off, we see that communication, cooperation, team playing, problem solving, top three, again, that does not seem to have varied over the four years that this, that this data represents. And, and in fact, there've been very few changes and the skills demanded overall. And um, just so, so you all know, the reason why 2020 is as far back as I can go is the, the labor market data that I am working with, uh, that's how far the job posting data um, goes back. So I am a little bit limited in how far we can look back there. Next, um, we do see some minor movement in the order of skills, but the top 10, again, are largely remaining the same. So, you know, just for example, you've got organization and supervision management that are flip-flopping there between 2020 and 2023. Um, and even the next four skills um, are, all, uh, are all the same. So again, very, very similar across time. However, um, when we get down to the 10th skill most in demand, um, we see that there's two entirely different skills, customer service and project management. And while, again, this is kind of a, a shorter period of time and we, could, we need to be cautious in any sort of conclusions or inferences that we might make, I think that this is interesting to, um, to look at because of what we know about how AI may be shifting skill demand. Uh, and I think it'll be important to keep an eye on these trends moving forward. So another question that we want to answer is, does skill demand differ by education levels? We we're starting to see that in the natural in the, the literature that we reviewed, but what, what is happening in the SREB states? So this table provides the top 10 skills demanded, soft skills, success skills demanded for um, jobs requiring a high school diploma, an associate degree, or a bachelor's degree over the past year in SREB states. So again, we're seeing that communication, it's consistent. It's the top one across all three education levels. And, and this includes um, both verbal and written communication. When we look at 
the number two and number three spots um, by education level, here's where we start to see some different things coming up. And so, for example, I've highlighted here uh, the skills demanded for high school. And um, we can see that for a high school degree, customer service is prioritized over cooperation. And that's you know, likely due to the fact that most of the jobs at this level tend to be more service oriented. But it kind of points to a trend within this data that in general, the skills demanded become more complex as we move through the continuum of education levels. And so problem solving um, really highlights this perfectly. Um, you can see that uh, as, as the degree becomes higher, the education needed is greater, problem solving moves, uh, the ranking of problem solving moves up steadily throughout this list until it gets into our number three spot for jobs requiring a bachelor's degree. And we can also see that more complex skills like analytical or project management move into the top 10 for this education level. And so this can suggest that there's perhaps a need to think about um, success skill development as, again, a continuum or something that can be scaffolded throughout uh, somebody's career and education experience. So now I'm just gonna shift gears a little bit um, to talk about uh, another aspect of the report where we looked at what states are currently doing to address success skills. And um, because success skills are important and, and policymakers, education leaders have been aware of the need for development for students and job seekers, there's a number of different strategies that they're trying to implement to address their development in both secondary and post-secondary education. Um, some states have developed, for example, profiles or portraits of graduates to highlight the skills that are developed in their institutions and communicate to employers the competencies that their graduates are equipped with. Um, states and institutions have also pursued credentials that are either state developed or purchased from a third party to demonstrate a basic level of confidence, competency of the credential holders. Um, these micro-credentials may be paired with a course or signed up for independently, depending on the, um, the guidance of the state or the institution. And finally, um, work-based learning or project-based learning as well have been expanding in a number of SREB states as well as across the, um, across the country. And I'm just going to spend a, a moment um, here on work-based learning. Um, you know, partially because our guest speaker, Dr. Proctor, um, is going to discuss a, a more specific example um, of work-based learning and practice, but also because there's a, a lot more research um, about the, the effectiveness of work-based learning in terms of a program and policy options. Um, and so these programs uh, allow students to gain real-world experiences and develop both technical and success skills relevant for a number of different careers. And they have been shown to be particularly effective at developing these skills due to the ongoing opportunities for observation and feedback. And finally, um, they are associated with better employment outcomes overall, um, particularly when it comes to things like job attainment due to the leg up and experience that they provide for student participants and the ability that they, uh, they have to kind of really round out a resume for students. And so just to kind of summarize the, you know, what we covered in the report as well as in this presentation, um, we've identified three success skills that are consistently the most demanded by employers both nationally and within the SREB region. Um, skills demanded do vary, and this variation suggests it is important for policymakers and education leaders to consider how skill development can be tailored for specific industries or scaffolded to meet students and job seekers where they are in their career based on their education and experience. And finally, we know that there is still a gap between supply and demand of these skills. Um, and we need to be ever more aware of this gap as skill demands shift or intensify due to changes in the workforce. And before I turn it over to Dr. Proctor, I just wanna leave you all with this quote from an opinion piece um, from the New York Times last month. LinkedIn recently conducted a survey of industry executives 
Um, and over 70% of those responding executives say that they would prioritize soft skills or success skills over highly technical AI skills. And um, for me, I believe that this response kind of captures the need for focus on these skills, as well as I believe gives us a starting point in how to meet the workforce changes driven by AI. So we not, may not be able to predict the technical skills needed in five or 10 years, but we can focus on the skills that make humans most successful. And with that, I will turn it over to my colleague, Tim Shaughnessy, to introduce our guest speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Courtney, for a very interesting presentation. Uh, my name is Tim Shaughnessy, and I serve as Director of Career Pathways at SREB. I want to thank you for joining us this afternoon. Courtney highlighted insights into key success skills that are in demand across all employment sectors. We now want to focus on how to successfully address these skills with students, adults, and incumbent workers. Dr. Rose Proctor is uniquely qualified to do this. Rose has been involved with Georgia Best from its inception in, in 2011. For the past 12 years, she has been instrumental in the evolution of Georgia Best as a national leader in success skill curriculum, assessment, and instruction with the capacity to serve audiences from pre-K through bachelor's degree. Dr. Proctor serves as the Associate Director for Ethics and Compliance at the University System of Georgia and as Executive Director of the Truist Center for Ethical Leadership at the University of North Georgia. Thank you, Dr. Proctor, for being with us today. Yeah, so hopefully everybody can hear me okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, as Tim mentioned, my name is Rose. Um, I am, uh, you know, really excited just to kind of talk about the Georgia Best program with you. Who you don't see alongside me here today is Karina Robinson. She serves as the director for the Georgia Best program for the state of Georgia. Um, she is employed by the Technical College System of Georgia and wonderful for her is on annual leave today. So hopefully somewhere really exciting and, and magical in comparison to us here at work. So I'm going to talk uh, about, um, at a high level, our partnerships, but as Tim already mentioned, uh, and I just introduced uh, Karina, the Technical College System of Georgia, um, the University of North Georgia, which is housed inside the USG, that makes up 26 different higher education institutions across the state of Georgia, um, and uh, along with the Georgia Department of Education. Um, we, we partner very closely on this program. It is not without fail. We always keep um, the... Um, um, logo of CTURN up here, that is the CTAE Resource Network. Um, they were instrumental in providing some funds uh, on the front end for our pilot, um, as Tim mentioned. So when we think about what we're going to go over really quickly, just at a high level, we're going to talk about why we developed the program, going back to some of the uh, research that Courtney talked about, but in our own state in Georgia. Um, the program itself, how it works, the impacts, and just some testimonials, kind of some models, some partnerships that we've made um, that make that program um, effective for our students as a state model um, to need, you know, gain these needed employability skills um, to basically advance them for our state, right? What high wage, high demand, you know, career opportunities we have in the state of Georgia for our economics. So um, why we developed it is kind of like Courtney, right? We did a survey across the state of Georgia. We had responses from over 700 employers and loud and clear, they spoke to these, you know, this gap in employability skills in the sense of like, hey, it's great that you guys are focusing on the hard skills. They're, they're a great accountants, but if they can't speak to the numbers and problem solve and critically think about those numbers, then their accountancy skills are not as important to us. And so we, we launched in 2011. Um, we piloted in, in 2012 with 20 different high schools um, and then moved into our pilot with middle schools as well. And so as Tim mentioned, we've been doing this now for over 10 years. And so we're, we're excited to share some of those impacts with you um, today. So what Georgia Best is, right, is Georgia Best stands for Georgia Business Employability Skills Training. So this goes back to that same terminology. SREB is choosing success skills. Um, we talked about them as employability skills for our students to be able to be employable in the state and add value back to our state's economy um, and open up, you know, quality of life and opportunities for them as well. Uh, and basically, the purpose for us is that economic prosperity um, to decrease um, e sorry about that. 
um, to decrease um, employer turnover rates, um, you know, due to the lack of these skills. So as Courtney mentioned about that gap, right, that the employers are needing these skills and they've got job openings and people are applying uh, and, and they're not finding these skills either in the, uh, in the application process or once they come on board, they're not demonstrating these skills. Um, and so they're having to be either upskilled or unfortunately um, terminated from those positions. And so we see that in the state of Georgia as well. Um, a lot of feedback back from our Department of Labor that, you know, 68% of our graduates are not losing their jobs because they don't understand um, their hard skills well enough. They're losing them because of a lack of these employability skills. So it's pretty easy on how it works. Um, you just go to georgiabest.com in our state. Um, you'll, you'll see the register for Georgia Best. You can register at different levels and I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, and, and then inside that, we've got the breakdown in three big buckets. So once you're registered, it opens up a curriculum that really focuses on 15 different attributes. These do include the competencies um, that Courtney mentioned about communication, teamwork, and, and problem solving. Um, but they're in three buckets of personal characteristics, then interactions with others, and then employer expectations. And so kind of we work with our students um, inside these buckets on those. And we do that at three different levels in our programming. So the Georgia Best at School is a curriculum that's built for our teachers to facilitate in the classroom. Um, and of course, online options as well. Everybody in this in this call knows all about COVID and how we were thrown into online. So we've got both versions of in-person and online pedagogy for our teachers um, that focus on those 15 competencies um, that teachers can observe in the classroom. And then it goes to um, Georgia Best at Work, um, which is a curriculum built for trainers to facilitate in the workplace. Um, and then Georgia Best at Home. So we found a lot of our citizens in Georgia, if they weren't alongside a school or an employer, they had a lot less resources. And so we wanted them to be able to engage in this on their own development. Um, and so we also developed a track for Georgia Best at Home. So this is a self-directed study that any citizen in the state of Georgia can come into at no cost and walk through the 15 attributes and, and then gain their certificate. Now, the certificates on the different levels um, vary, and so we'll, we'll go into that in just a moment. We're going to focus on Georgia Best at School, um, just because the SREB, and particularly this group, um, focuses on dual enrollment and what it looks like around um, the education um, aspect. And so we make the program materials and the curriculum resources accessible as a, a, a higher education institution. We know all the compliance, ADA, all of those types of things. Um, but also accessible in the sense that we know that our learners are different. And so on each one of our lesson plans, we have teacher um, resources for if they have audio learners, right? If they have kinetic learners, ESL, right, um, students. And so we do break that down. We organize them by grade. I'm just showing you the example for high school that's ninth through 12th um, here on the screen. And we're going to kind of dive into that as an example. But um, I want to want to stress that we know that it starts way before then. So in higher education, the message from our employers was by the time they get to you, a lot of these attributes around personal characteristics um, are already set and they've got a lot of behaviors that are set. And so we wanna just start working with them really early on across the state. So our programming goes from pre-K to post-secondary. So the first is pre-K through second, then there's a curriculum for second through fifth that's staggered by grade and then six through eight before they even get into the high school, high school curriculum. So we're helping our teachers all the way from pre-K um, to post-secondary in the state. As an example, as I mentioned about high school programming, um, the ninth grade curriculum, um, once they kind of log into the learning management system that's statewide um, inside D2L, everything's kind of organized for them in those three um, different big buckets, right? Personal characteristics, interactions with others, and the employer expectations. Now, as you can imagine, we do change that by grade level appropriateness. So for pre-K, it's not employer expectations, it's your teacher expectations. Instead of adhering to policy, it's following the rules. You know, so all the terminology is grade specific and age appropriate. Once you dive into one of those, and I've just selected attitude as an example, um, the teachers are given the full lesson plans. Those come with definitions. There's six different activities to integrate into the classroom that are in 20 minute sections. As you know, our teachers are very busy. Um, sometimes they don't have a lot of time um, to dedicate to this. And so we've got them down in easy digestible 20 minute increments for our teachers. 
Um, you can see there, there's an overview video alongside that lesson plan. It comes with a lot of our teacher resources. Um, there's also ethical scenarios at every grade level. Um, so in our pre-K, it's talking about, you know, handling things on the playground all the way up until our post-secondary of handling complex issues, as Courtney mentioned, around artificial intelligence integration, humanoid robotics. Um, you know, autonomous vehicle integration into the logistics industry, you can imagine. And so we've written all of those scenarios out um, age appropriate. And then there's also resources. So these resources come at different levels. So there's a teacher's guide as a resource for our teachers in the classroom. There's resources for our students, for them to have as homework. But we also integrated parent resources. So as you guys can imagine, particularly when you're dealing with the younger grades, it's just as important to educate our parents and our communities as it is our students um, and, and employees. And so for the younger grades, we do have those parent resources educating our students along the way, even just in options of career path. Um, so Courtney was talking about healthcare versus um, you know, different industries. And so sometimes our parents are not recognizing that even industries exist in their state for employment. And so we're educating them along the way as well. I mentioned about the certificate. So this goes back into to Courtney's um, mentioning about just credentialing. Um, we want the students to, the employers to know that students have been through the Georgia Best Program. So they do have an option for two different layers. So there's a participation certificate. Um, I'm going to focus on the work-based learning or youth apprenticeship. That's what that YAP at the top stands for um, certificate, which is also equivalent to our at-work certificate. Um, inside the school, if they're doing the Georgia Best at School, you can see the requirements here um, of, of what they have to maintain and demonstrate within their school. But then the Georgia Best at Work or the Work-Based Learning goes beyond that. They also have to, at an 80% um, overall average or higher, be observed demonstrating these um, characteristics and competencies at an employer for 90 days or more. And so that's a really critical component. It's one thing to show discipline in the classroom um, and initiative. It's a different thing to show that in an employer environment for a duration of three months or longer. Um, and so that's really what it takes to get the Georgia Best at Work certificate. We are doing a lot of partnerships um, a, a, a across industry, business, and education, bringing those three partners together. So in the work-based learning frequency observation tool, you're getting two observations. You're getting one from the teacher in the classroom that they're submitting online for that particular student, but you're also getting the employer. So that designated point of contact at the employer is filling out this frequency observation tool. And they're, you know, in real time talking about what they observed. So for me, right? So Rose, how's her attitude? If that's positive and you can see the definitions down below of what that, what that criteria is, how often are they observing that from me over a 90 day period on the job? Is it seldom? Um, is it observed? Is it consistently observed? Um, you know, it, my flexibility, my ability to be organized, um, my discipline, my integrity. And so all of these personal characteristics kind of bleed down in, inside. So let's shift from the program itself and how it works to impact. So you can see on your screen here um, that we've had a pretty big impact since inception. So um, to date, we have over 3,000 teachers, um, and I'm just showing you as an example, the Georgia Best at School program. Um, and this year, and it's only March 7th, we've had 40 new teachers enroll in the program. Um, and so that's kind of what that means. That new ENC is your educators and coordinators across the state of Georgia. You can see the heat map of where they're located. Um, they're using this curriculum in their classrooms and they have access to it. We've had 40 new come on since January 1st. Um, we're in over a thousand schools uh, across and that um, runs the gamut from elementary to middle school and high school, although the predominance of those are your high school um, curriculum teachers. Um, we're in 155 of the 159 counties in the state of Georgia. Um, and the organizations you see there are engaged in, in, in work-based learning. These are nonprofit, these are industry or, or corporate or businesses um, that are actually engaging with our students um, either in the at work um, certificate directly as an employer or with our students in work-based learning. So just to kind of give you an idea of the impact in the state of Georgia um, that the program is having um, in a visual way. Um, also in impacts, we wanted to kind of highlight at a high level um, some of our, our success stories. So from the North Georgia region, 
Um, you know, I'm I'm in that region. We service 32 counties um, at UNG across the North Georgia um, region. And inside those counties, we've had two that really we just wanted to highlight for Scythe County Schools and Hall County Schools. So these schools have over 30 schools um, in their districts um, from elementary to middle school to high school, um, including some um, career academies uh, in both of these counties. Um, and they're servicing you know, thousands and thousands of students. They have embedded their CTA work-based learning and we've partnered with the Georgia Department of Education on Standard One to assist our teachers to use Georgia Best to be able to get to that exemplary rating. Um, and to also be able to provide them the evidence that they need. So they've got access to the students that were in the program, or the curriculum that they've went through, their frequency observation tools and their certificate, um, and, and also the employers that are engaged. Um, and so this also helps our teachers, particularly as Courtney was mentioning about that pathway through work-based learning specifically. We also didn't want it just to be for work-based learning students. As you know, those students are getting opportunities alongside our employers because of the pathway and the track that they've selected. This has now been embedded and, and is accessible to teachers outside of work-based learning and our career pathways, um, but teachers that are also just teaching in the core curriculum as well um, as some of our academies, like our STEM academies and Alliance academies in the North Georgia area. So we've been excited about that. <clears throat> Another highlight around impact is our technical college system. So I mentioned to you the director is housed in the TCSG here in the state of Georgia. Um, we're just taking one because we only have a limited amount of time with you. But just to highlight one, Athens Technical College has embedded the Georgia Best at Work curriculum into their adult ed and GED programming. Um, they do it in a condensed program within a two-week accelerated focus. Um, bringing that curriculum into um, Atlanta Technical and working alongside those that are obtaining a GED to work on these core competencies. Um, they do give the uh, Georgia Best at School Work um, Certificate, uh, and that that is signed, um, you know, both uh, from our from the higher education system and the USG as well as the technical college system. And then finally, just similar programs that are are um, in alignment with this. So. You know, at the University of North Georgia, one of the things when we started building the curriculum out for Georgia Best was that in post-secondary, our students should definitely be exposed to this curriculum at a collegiate level as well. Um, so it's not just, you know, the core curriculum and, and the classes they need to go through for their disciplines, but it is also all about these soft skills um, and these employability skills and making sure that we're developing the students as a whole person. Um, to be able to go into the, you know, the career field and, and to be career ready. So um, UNG launched the Professional Roadmap to Ongoing Success, or what's called the PROS program. Um, it aligns with a lot of the same attributes, um, but at a collegiate level. And, and students go through that all the way from freshman um, upon graduation. And, and as Tim knows, it's been a it's been a big uh, hurdle, um, but it is now a graduation requirement. So as much as your 120 hours um, in your in your major field alongside your core curriculum, um, it is now a graduation requirement for those in the College of Business at the University of North Georgia to have completed the pros program to have those um, those um, employability skills that have not just been educated to, but demonstrated before they graduate the university. Um, and so all students in the College of Business, um, and, and, and that's about 4,500 students uh, per year currently of the 20,000 at the University of North Georgia have that graduation requirement. Um, and then the curriculum is also uh, available to all of our students, um, but it is required for our business students going into industry. You can see here, it's got a mobile app. So we go to where our students are at. They're able to track their progress, scan events um, as they come in through the door very easily, um, you know, and, and get credit for attending different presentations, for going to mock interviews, for, um, you know, giving presentations to the board, all those types of things. Um, and so as they, you know, do those experiences, they're gaining that credit towards graduation. <clears throat> so in closing, you know, basically the Georgia Best has been a pretty great success. I know Courtney was talking about state models that are examples um, for the state of Georgia. This this program really has done a lot here for us um, in, in providing that engagement of bringing industry, you know, business and education together, um, but on a really large scale from pre-K to post-secondary. 
And our goal basically is just to add value to Georgia employers, our citizens and communities and beyond um, once our, our students graduate. So Tim and, and Dale, I'm really thankful to have been able to just share our model uh, and our example um, today in your program. And I'll turn it back over to Dale for any questions or thoughts um, about what we're doing here in Georgia. Thank you, Dr. Proctor. We appreciate that great presentation and exciting things going on in your secondary and post-secondary programs in Georgia. Uh, we have about two minutes with Dr. Proctor before she has to leave. So if you have a question, if you want to quickly put that in the chat, anything about the Georgia Best in the next two minutes, she'll be happy to answer that. Um, but we encourage you to put that question in quickly and she'll that or if after she leaves and we go on a few more minutes if you leave a question we'll be sure to get that to her and get the answer back to you yeah and dale just in closing there's a lot of information out on the website if you are interested in the program karina robinson is the director you're also welcome to reach out to her at any time and I, I promise you dale and tim can find us uh, with any questions that the srab members may have as well thank you i do appreciate that thank you again for having me All right. So as we think about moving forward, we just want to leave uh, each one of you with a charge and talk about some next steps at SREB. We encourage everyone to provide your teachers, your professors, and counselors with professional learning related to success skills and thinking about ways in which you can integrate these into uh, courses at every grade level. Create program advisory committees for all content areas. I know most of our CTE programs already have program advisory committees as um, highly recommended or required by state um, regulation, but we encourage that all content areas have program advisory committees where you collaborate with your regional business and industry representatives to have conversations around those skills most needed by the industry and utilize your business and industry to help you in developing relevant assignments and create those performance-based assessments so that you can ensure the integration of these uh, success skills. We also encourage you to continue to develop and implement work-based learning opportunities for all students at secondary and post-secondary levels. Uh, if we look at some of the requirements or, or the request in uh, job postings, or as we interview uh, industry, uh, one of the number one requests is that individuals have experience and how better can students get to, uh, experience than actually doing work-based learning while they're in their uh, program of study. We encourage everyone to network with educators and business and industry representatives to identify promising practice that can be shared and replicated. At SRB, we promise that that's what we'll continue to do is we're going to continue to um, look at promising practices related to success skills and the implementation of those. We also are going to be uh, going deeper into how do we assess these skills in our classrooms, whether it be in the secondary setting or the post-secondary setting, and how do we then uh, signify or let our employers know that students have gained these skills. Uh, do we do that through some type of performance-based assessment? Is there a third-party credential or a certificate that should be uh, added? We're going to look at some of that and continue to study those things at SREB. Tim and Courtney, any other ideas or uh, things that you would like to leave the group with today? I would just sort of ask that as you go about your work, if you could think about the importance of just sort of thinking a little differently that, uh, you know, I like to quote a, a colleague that I worked with on a nursing career pathway that it's, it's great that we teach students to write a book report on Moby Dick, but can we also teach them to write a marketing plan or a patient incident report? So we just sort of need to think about old things perhaps in a new way and uh, just recognizing that Today's students are going to have to continually learn to adjust to this crazy changing environment, especially with the emergence of uh, AI. Courtney, where do you see the next uh, focus of the research in this area to be? Um, so I think one of the, you know, as I was sharing some of the previews of the research that I'm doing about looking at the difference in education levels and differences across industries, 
And I think also we really need to keep a, an eye towards how um, the the AI and, and automation is really changing up these skills. Again, it, it seems like now what we're hearing uh, industry leaders say is that it's not just, you know, the, just the technical skills is not enough anymore. And that in order to really be um, effective and, and really, you know, shine in these professions, it's technical and the success skills. And so it is, it's, you know, and, and, and more and more. Thank you. Well, we appreciate your taking some time to spend with us today. If you need uh, more information or have questions, we would be glad to uh, speak with you or send you information. You see on this slide the email addresses for each person who participated in today's webinar. You have Courtney, Tim, mine, and uh, Dr. Proctor's email addresses. Feel free to reach out to us at any time, and we'll continue to keep a focus on these success skills and how schools and institutions can ensure that they're being implemented and assessing those and helping employers uh, find the right uh, individuals to meet their needs. Again, thank you for your time this afternoon. We hope you all have a great day.